if you could go back in time and were given the opportunity to sign the Declaration of Independence, could you have done it? You know, I think about similar questions. I don't know if I've ever thought about this one specifically, but I, I have thought about like, would I be a patriot or would I be a loyalist? And the honest truth is I vacillate because it, it was such a complicated time. Like I can totally see the comfort in staying loyal to the crown and, you know, knowing that my family might be safe under the crown, especially if I was in crown occupied territory. And other times I read the grievances that people had and I'm like, I, I agree with that. Of course I would be a patriot. And, you know, I think my own family is a reflection of this because I have patriots and loyalists in my family tree. So I think it's a really complicated question. And I, I don't mean to give a non-answer. Um, it's just, I really do think about it and you know, I I can't come up with a clear answer. And I think it's just because I live in a completely different world. If you did sign the Declaration of Independence, where would you have put your name? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I'm from Boston in Massachusetts, so I probably would have um, signed with my fellow, my fellow delegates. Uh, I would have looked to see where Samuel Adams and John Adams were signing their names. Um, and maybe that would have made sense. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by Liz Covart. She's a historian who focuses on American history at the time of the Revolution. She's also the host of a very popular podcast called Ben Franklin's World. In this episode, we'll talk with Liz about the American Declaration of Independence. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today we're going to talk about the Declaration of Independence, some of the stories behind it, and the actual drafting of the one document that changed the course of history. Liz, you are a historian who focuses on the revolutionary period of American history, and you host one of my favorite podcasts, Ben Franklin's World. Can you tell us how you decided to spend your life teaching others about the American Revolutionary War period? You know, I became a history junkie pretty early on. My parents had a travel trailer and they would take us throughout the United States, lots of New England, because that's where I grew up, to every national park and historic site that they could find. And I think, you know, especially being in New England, Boston born, my dad worked there. We'd go into the city and walk the Freedom Trail every year. I just became really fascinated by the revolutionary period. And, you know, as your icebreaker suggested, it's it's a complicated period and it's a really exciting one to study. So I knew I loved history. I went off to college to major in something completely different. And I just couldn't get over the fact that I wanted to major in history. So I got an internship with the National Park Service that turned into a job. Then I went off to grad school and became a historian. And I, now I work for the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. So I just love early American history and I can't get enough of it. How did you decide to get into podcasting? <laughs> You know, I moved to Boston after graduate school. I decided I didn't want to become a professor. My partner, Tim, got a job in Cambridge at, at the Google office there. So I was living in the city, enjoying urban life and walking everywhere. And I found podcasts and like, they're great, right? They're the perfect media for our mobile age. We can pop our earbuds into our ears while we're walking around the city or turn on our favorite podcasts and podcast hosts in our car while we're commuting. And we can be turning this time where we can't be doing something else into something completely enriching. And so I fell in love with podcasts about social media and business because I thought, you know, I'm going to I'm going to start a history business of some sort. And then I turned to history podcasts and I just couldn't find one I wanted to listen to. And none of them focused on early American history, which I do think is the most fascinating period in all of history. So I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to start one. And then I researched them for 18 months and came up with Ben Franklin's world and we're about four years old now and still going strong. It's great. And you have other ones that have followed suit since then, but that's nice. Now I'm going to ask another question, and this one here is a little bit more specific. There are a lot of misconceptions about the signature at the top of the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock, people think he's the first to sign the Declaration because of where his signature is. Can you explain why he signed it where he did and the way he did? You know, John Hancock was the president of the Continental Congress at the time, 
And, you know, I have to be honest, you know, I know the myths of he signed it because he wants so big because he wanted King George to be able to see it, you know, without his reading glasses on. Uh, I don't know if that was the, the case, but as the president of Congress, he would have been expected to and did sign it in a very prominent place. Now we get into the history of the Declaration itself. The Declaration of Independence was signed. It was adopted by the Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776. But work started on it in early June of that year, but there was so much that led up to it. Liz, can you tell us why we needed the Declaration of Independence at that time and why at that time that it was signed? Sure. You know, there's a lot of different scholarship on the Declaration. Danielle Allen believes that they started working on the Declaration because there was a constitutional crisis in New Hampshire in 1776. Essentially, New Hampshire didn't have a government. Their royal governor had vacated. They didn't have any anybody in the position of power. So they needed to create a new government in order to function. So they wrote to the Continental Congress and said, hey, we need to form a new government. What exactly are we supposed to do? And this was a complicated question because nominally the colonies were all under the protection of King George III in Parliament. So how do you form a new government without permission from your old government? So this was a big question. You know, what do you do that now we're under one government, but we need our own governments and you can't form a new government while in an existing government? Another big problem was the colonies had supplies, they had some men, but they didn't have enough of it to face the best army in the entire world at that point. The British army had proven to the world that it could kick anyone's butt, essentially, during the uh, French and Indian or Seven Years' War between 1754 and 1763. And so the Americans, they weren't like the most disciplined fighting force at all. I mean, it would take George Washington throughout most of the war to whip up a disciplined continental army, ver- you know, version of the army. And so they really needed European aid. They needed gunpowder. They needed shot. They needed food and clothing and tents. They needed supplies. And, you know, everywhere the British went, they either took those supplies or they burned them down so that the Continentals couldn't use them. Of course, the Continentals did that to the British army too. So they relied on a lot of smuggling from the Caribbean islands, islands like St. Eustatius. From France, they were setting up, you know, these covert Shipping operations where France and Spain would send supplies through these routes and hopefully, you know, the British ships wouldn't catch them. So what do you do when you have these foreign governments? You have Spain, the Netherlands and France who were all embarrassed during that French and Indian or Seven Years War. They want to get back at England. But do you want to support 13 independent nations or this group of colonies that hasn't declared their independence that might, you know, go back to Great Britain Also, this is a world of monarchies, right? Like the Netherlands is the only place that doesn't have a monarchy. So what do you do with the fact that King George III has said, my colonies are an open and avowed rebellion? Do you jump in as France and Spain with your own kingdoms and say, I'm going to help the rebels? Like, that's really bad for the monarchy business. So they don't. So the, the Declaration of Independence was really meant to separate from Great Britain so that the new states could form new governments so that they could declare to Europe that we're independent, we're not looking to go back to Great Britain, we're open for business in terms of supplies and funding that you might send us for for the war effort. And it was also meant to serve as a rallying cry for Americans. You know, you have a big split. We can't tell you how many people were loyalists because the records aren't that good, but there's a huge percentage of Americans who remain loyal to the crown, a huge percentage of people who were undecided, and another percentage of people who were steadfast to the patriot cause how do you unite all these people, especially when they're coming from 13 different places? The Declaration of Independence was also meant to serve as a, as a something that united the Americans behind each other. A lot of people think that the Declaration was something that preceded actual hostilities. But what they may not realize because of the dates was that uh, there were skirmishes already happening. In fact, in April of 1775, local militia in Lexington and Concord, have already done battle with the British Army, with the Royal Army. And there was a great deal of unrest in the colonies that led up to the revolution. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. There were two basic issues that I've read, and I'm going to ask if you can explain that, Liz. And one of them was taxation, and the other was frontier policy. Could you explain those two things and why 
those two things caused colonists to become dissatisfied with the current rule of, of Britain. Well, these are just two of the many issues that historians will say caused the revolution. Of course, if you put 100 historians in a room and ask them what caused the revolution, you will get basically 100 different answers. But taxation is a really good one to start at. So the French and Indian War, that's what we call it over here in the colonies, is the French and Indian War. It was also the Seven Years' War back in Europe. That is one of the last great major wars for empire in North America. You had Spain, France, and Great Britain vying for control of the North American continent. And what happens is Great Britain, to wage this war, basically starts writing blank checks. You need soldiers? Okay, here's a blank check. You need supplies? Okay, here's a blank check. And they more than double their war debt. And at that time, governments didn't believe that keeping a debt was a good thing. So they, after the war, needed to figure out a way to pay that debt off. Now, they never really intended for the colonies to contribute to paying that debt. What they wanted the colonies to do was to pay for the 10,000 troops they planned to station in North America to protect its frontier line, to stay up in Canada, to prevent the French from coming back, to stay out, you know, in places like Pittsburgh, which were like the far reaches, the western reaches of the empire at that point, and Florida and other places in the West to protect British holdings and to keep the peace with Native Americans. Those troops cost a lot of money to not only pay for their salary, but to pay to clothe them, to pay to feed them. Keep in mind, there are no good roads to these places. So bringing supplies out to them is a really expensive ordeal. And so you start to see different taxation member measures come through parliament. At first, they say, OK, we're going to pass the Sugar Act. And Americans were kind of like okay with it because it was basically a trade a, a taxation measure that regulated trade and no one ever disputed the Great Britain's right to regulate trade in the colonies. So they that was kind of lackluster, but then they pass a Stamp Act in 1765. This tax is like the most vociferous people in the colonies. Lawyers, you want a legal degree, you got to pay for a, that on a piece of stamp paper. You want to have a real estate transaction, no problem, that has to go on stamp pa paper. Playing cards, newspapers. Who plays with playing cards? Lots of sailors. They come into town and now all of a sudden they have to pay a tax on playing cards. There were a lot of different enumerated paper goods that were supposed to bear the stamp tax. And especially in New England, and it's not just in New England, but especially in New England, you have people going like Samuel Adams, like, this is crazy, right? Parliament does not have a right to tax us. We fall under the dominion of the king, not so much Parliament no represent, you know, no taxation without representation was a slogan get that gets later thrown around and they take great issue with it. So they have major rebellions. There's a big Stamp Act riot in Boston. They basically t tear down Andrew Oliver's tax hut. Um, he has like a tamp uh, tax uh, wooden tax office to distribute these stamps down near Long Wharf. They tear it down by hand. They go into his house, trash it, drink his good wine. A week or two later, they go to Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson's house. Hutchinson came out as a vocal supporter of his in-law and Oliver and said, no, like we have to pay these taxes. And the Bostonians were like, no, we don't. And they went over to his house and sacked it. In fact, the Hutchinson family just got out in the nick of time. So that happens in August of 1765. And then there are other Stamp Act riots that take place in New York in Philadelphia and other places. So the colonists are really unhappy about it. So Great Britain repeals that act, and then they come up with other ideas of what acts they could pass to get these taxation measures through. Another major set of acts was the Townsend duties. They enumerated goods like paint, um, window glass. There are a whole bunch tea, a whole bunch of acts that are goods that are taxed by those Townsend duties. And again, that there's protest. They end up, because of the Boston Massacre, repealing those duties to kind of like cool tensions down with the colonies. The Boston Massacre happens in March 1770. They repeal the Townsend duties, but they leave one tax available. It's kind of like they wanted to do it quietly. If they had this tax, then the colonists would be OK with it if they paid it. And then later Parliament could go to them, see, say, see, you've been paying this tax. That was the Tea Act. And of course... The colonists didn't necessarily pay that. You have the Boston Tea Party in December 1773. So this issue of taxation, as you brought it up, is a major point. It goes to the heart of can Parliament 
without direct representatives from the North American colonies pass taxes and expect Americans to pay them without representation. The other issue you brought up is frontier policy. That French and Indian War really expanded the British Empire in North America. Before the British Empire in North America had basically been a few Caribbean islands and then the 13 colonies plus Maine, because Maine is part of Massachusetts at that point. But you can picture from Maine down to Georgia on the eastern seaboard. And that was basically British North America. After that war, Great Britain basically goes to the Mississippi River. They get Canada, what we now know as Canada from the French. They collect more islands in the Caribbean and they start to get worldwide posts. This is when they get their first post in places like India. So it greatly expands the British Empire. And when you're the British Empire, you see the colonies growing. And one of your fears is they might actually become independent. Like they are growing too big and too unwieldy for us to govern. We need to have a plan. So a historian named Max Edelson actually looked at the Board of Trade's ideas about how they could organize these colonies and more effectively govern them. And one plan they came up with, we're going to map them and really see this territory in detail and then limit their expansion. So Americans really want to move west. They see moving west as a way to get better land, as a way to expand, as a way to increase their trade and their worth. And then maybe even someday, some would think, become their own independent nation, not not even independent nation, but their own self-governing unit as part of the British Empire. They saw themselves as equals to the British Empire in England. And the colonists objected when England came in and said, no, you know, England saying, look, expansion is really expensive. We have to station troops out there to protect you, the Native Americans. Like every time you move west, you have conflict, major conflict with Native Americans. And we want to keep the peace. You know, a lot of these tribes came out and helped us during this French and Indian War. We don't really want to disturb the relationships we have with them. So you have basically two opposing views. The Americans are like, let's expand as fast as we can. And Great Britain going, whoa, there. Let's do this in a very organized way, in a way that makes sense for the growth of the empire, and in a way we can actually make some revenue on the land. Um, and a lot of Americans, even like George Washington, objected to this. They objected because there was this almost instinctive need to go west and there was also this uh, this feeling that the land was theirs to be had, right? Yeah, you know, there's a, you know, especially in the Puritans, again, in New England, they have this idea that God gave them the land to do what they wanted to. Like, that's part of, um, you know, some of the Puritan beliefs. And they have that very early on. And so they take it from Native Americans and they do what they want with it. But yeah, there is this idea that God put this land on the earth and sent people to North America, these Europeans to North America, to control and possess and own it in ways that they saw fit. So if there's trees on the land, they want those trees for any sort of things that you could use trees for. If it has natural resources, again, that was decided that those natural resources were there for Americans to profit from, make use of. You described all of the years that led up to the 1770s, and so we know this was not an overnight revolution. In October 1775, King George III became very outspoken against these rebellious colonies that you described, and he ordered the expansion of his army and his navy, and that pretty much sent a signal to the colonies that if they're headed towards independence, it's almost like that's their only option. They started to get that signal. So in late 1775, Benjamin Franklin communicated with the French, and he kind of sent a signal to them that the colonies were leaning towards independence and maybe could use some help. But the French, as you kind of said, they needed this to be official. There were so many reasons for this to become an official declaration of independence. Well, in 1775, there are only a few radicals who really want independence. You're talking about men like Samuel Adams, who think that they re the United Colonies should just have independence from Great Britain. Most colonists at this point are proud to be British they participated in that big French and Indian in seven years war, and they just want to be treated as equals. They want representation. They want to reconcile their differences. In 1775 in April, you have, a, as a follow up to the powder alarm that happens a little bit earlier, Great Britain knows that this thing is going to war. So Thomas Gage, who's commander in chief of the British forces, is stationed in Boston by 1775, and he's trying to get 
his hands on all of the arms and ammunition that belonged to the crown and take it out of the colonists' hand. Meanwhile, the colonists are in the area gathering up all the gunpowder, ammunition, and supplies that they could get their hands on because they also believe that this thing is going to lead to armed conflict. So in April of 1775, Gage gets intelligence that there's a massive store of armament and gunpowder out in Concord, Massachusetts. So he organizes his men. They go out on the night of the 18th of April in 1775. They march out to first Lexington, where they've been warned. So the militia is there in the wee hours of the morning to greet the British troops. And they fire upon them. It's a skirmish, but the British end up winning that skirmish and keep marching on to Concord. They get to Concord and they do seize those stores. But the Massachusetts and New England militia that has come into the area at that time plagues them all the way back. So the British take a huge hit um, in terms of their their military personnel on this fight because people are hiding behind trees and firing at them all the way back to Boston. So that's the battles of Lexington and Concord. And after that happens, between 15 and 20,000 New Englanders pour into the Boston area and they start creating siege lines. So they surround the Shawmut Peninsula, which is where Boston was at that point. It's just on this tiny little peninsula with this tiny little neck connecting it to the mainland. And they surround areas like Cambridge and Charlestown. You know, Charlestown's to the north of the peninsula. Cambridge is towards the west. Roxbury would be to the southwest corner, Dorchester Heights to the southeast corner, and they take those areas and secure them. And in June of 1775, you have the Massachusetts and New England representatives in Congress going, this thing has turned to war. We really need military help. And the Continental Army gets formed. That happens in June of 1775. And on June 15, 1775, the Continental Congress appoints George Washington to be the commander in chief of the Continental Army. As Washington readies to go to Boston, we have another major battle. The first, what they'll say is the first major battle of the revolution, Bunker Hill. It happens on June 17, 1775. Now, there's disputes about why this happens. It depends on the point of view. Having worked at the National Park Service at the Bunker Hill uh, monument site and talking about the battle for years, you know, my best read on it is. The colonists really wanted to distract the British from Dorchester Heights, which was the highest, you know, area in the in the region. And what they'd hoped to do was put cannons on it to kind of pressure the British to get out of the city. But they couldn't really they didn't have a really enough personnel and they didn't have enough cannons to do that right away. So they were looking to distract the British. So they dragged the British to the north of the peninsula in Charlestown and they have this battle. The colonists technically lose. The British take the hill. They take the ground. But they take it at about a 49 to 51 percent casualty rate. And the colonists end up getting what they want, which is the British are so beat up after this battle. They never take Dorchester Heights. And then over the winter of 75, 76, Henry Knox comes in with those big cannon from Ticonderoga and set them up on Dorchester Heights. And so the British have to leave the Boston area in March of 1776. So that's what happens at Boston. Then from there, the war goes south to New York City. The battles of Long Island and whatnot will happen. George Washington and the army will give the, you know, give those areas up. They have to retreat because of the superior naval power and forces of the British army. Again, you're talking about an army in in the continental side that is still not really well disciplined. So they're just doing the best they, they can facing this best army in the world. And this brings us to the question of like, We've now had a bunch of armed conflict. They're arming along the Canadian border in upstate New York and getting ready for battles down there. So what exactly is going on? So you have men like John Dickinson who said, nope, we really need to try and reconcile things. Let's send the Olive Branch petition out to the king. They don't even really ever hear word back. Like the king is just like non-responsive about this. And then it's like, okay, we have a lot of fighting going on. We need to figure out what we're doing. And by, you know, late winter spring of 1776 you have people going okay let's start talking about independence if we do independence how would this happen and on june 7 1776 richard henry lee introduces his resolution to congress that is the famous one that says these independent colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states and there were three components to his resolution there was the idea that they would 
declare independence and then again form foreign alliances. And a third is prepare their own new national government, which will eventually become the Articles of Confederation government. So that gets us to the point of the Declaration of Independence, where you have this resolution. And in June 1776, Congress starts taking steps to tackle those three things that Richard Henry Lee of Virginia introduced into Congress. And at that point, they form a committee. It's a committee of five, they called it. And Thomas Jefferson was elected to chair that committee. He was from Virginia. Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania. John Adams from Massachusetts. Roger Sherman from Connecticut, and Robert Livingston from New York. They were the Committee of Five, and they were the people that were charged with the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Of course, that's only one committee. There were many committees. Uh, the Continental Congress had many committees that were working on various things to coalesce this group to declare independence. So the first question for this committee, this Committee of Five that was charged with drafting the Declaration they didn't quite declare independence yet, but they were assigned to start drafting this declaration in anticipation that very soon the Continental Congress would declare independence from Great Britain. Can you say that this purpose of this document, and you talked about it earlier, but the purpose of this document was to officially justify the break with Great Britain. Can you explain who were the audiences for the Declaration of Independence? Sure. So again, the purpose of this document is to solve a very specific problem at this time. And the problems are, how can you form a new government when you're still attached to an old government? How can you s secure foreign aid when you need to secure, you know, when you're part of another government? And how do you rally Americans together? So those are the three problems the Declaration is meant to address. And the way that they tackle that is, again, by looking at their audience. One audience is King George III. They specifically address him and say, here are 27 things we don't like about being part of your government. And so this is why we're going to leave you. Another audience, of course, is the other European people and monarchs in the area saying, hey, we're declaring independence. We're open for your foreign investment in assistance. We have no intention of going back to King George III and Great Britain. So please consider helping us out in our war effort. And the third audience, of course, are fellow Americans. Like we are trying to go to this bigger goal of forming our own government, of being an independent nation. You're all a part of that. Like, like, let's band together and try to make the most out of this war effort and fight towards this big goal of independence and the va different values that we're telling you are in the Declaration of Independence. And I think it's important to note that Thomas Jefferson just drafted the document. You know, he did a lot of the heavy lifting. He served on the fewest committees. You pointed out there were a lot of committees. All the other committee members serve on a ton of committees. Thomas Jefferson serves on the fewest, and he's also the youngest. So he kind of gets the scut work of, of drafting this declaration. And he had lots of different examples to rely on when he did it. But, you know, he'd often take criticism after the fact of like, this is not like this new and none of the ideas you have in this declaration are new and novel. They've all been, you know, talked about for years and years. And Jefferson said, you know, it wasn't meant to have any new principles or arguments never before thought of. He said it was meant to be a an expression of the American mind at that time. It was meant to place before mankind common sense of the subject of self-government. So that's what he tried to do in the document. Again, create something that would address these three problems the Americans were facing at that time. And that's ultimately what went into the Declaration of Independence. Drafting of the Declaration of Independence. It started in uh, after the first week of June. It took roughly three weeks. Thomas Jefferson, who was his, he was in his early 30s at that time. He had input from John Adams and the others on that committee of five. But there were reasons they said that he was elected to the uh, chairmanship of that committee, other than the fact that he did have the fewest responsibilities on that committee. One of them was he was from Virginia. He was the only person from Virginia on that committee. The others were more from the northern colonies that I read. But another thing is people saw Thomas Jefferson as a good writer. Uh, but to your point, and this is where I want to go back and repeat it, they did ask Thomas Jefferson, basically, what was he trying to do with the Declaration? And to your point, you said he was not striving for originality 
of principle or sentiment. In other words, he wasn't trying to create this new thought. He was tapping thoughts and sentiments that already existed and actually drove the revolution to that point. So he wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. The other thing that you mentioned, and this is so, it's actually profound uh, when he said it, and that is he wanted this document, the Declaration of Independence, to serve as an expression of the American mind. Liz, can you explain what that meant? Sure. So he wanted to talk about why Americans in June of 1776 thought it expedient to declare their independence. So within the Declaration of Independence, you have 27 grievances against Great Britain that end up making it. There were a few grievances that got cut, you know, when the full body of the whole, all of Congress, you know, edits the document before they prove it. They end up cutting something like 25 percent of Thomas Jefferson's language out of the document. Um, So what makes it in the document are 27 grievances that they had about how Parliament and the king had basically violated their contract with the colonies. You know, the monarch was supposed to protect them in exchange for their allegiance. And that protection should have included protection from parliamentary overreach. And that goes back to, again, your your point about taxation and frontier, you know, the way that the West would expand. They felt that in those decisions, a lot of Americans felt that parliament had overreached its powers in trying to govern them. And the king didn't do his job to protect them. So they list out these grievances of why their cause is just, why declaring independence at that point is just. So that's what Jefferson was trying to do. Think of those 27 grievances are all reasons why the American Revolution happens. Again, even back then, you know, you could put 100 people in the room and get 100 different answers as to why the American Revolution happened. But these are 27 reasons why it happened, listed right there in the document. And, you know, at the end, you have of the declaration, there's a paragraph. And the historian Steve Pincus argues that in that last paragraph, what they're doing, what people like Jefferson are doing is laying a blueprint for government. So if not Great Britain's government, what kind of government are we going to have? And in that last paragraph, you'll find that as free and independent states, they believe they'll have the full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, Establish commerce with different areas, free trade. Again, a a similar issue of taxation had been a big beef with the colonists because England had restricted who they could trade with. And they gave themselves all the other powers to do all other things that independent states have a right to do. And those are the contents that you'll find in the Declaration. But you'll also find, especially in those two opening paragraphs, the ideals of equality and self-determination. You know, Danielle Allen has done a lot of research and she found that one of the ways that John Adams, one of those committee uh, members, had influenced Jefferson was, you know, he had wrote this pamphlet in January of 1776 called The Frailty of Human Nature. It was a pan- uh, it was actually a proclamation for, for the colony of Massachusetts. And Jefferson had that to rely on. And that proclamation was really kind of like a starting ground for John Adams to play around with ideas that he later expressed between March and April of 1776 in three letters that would become his larger pamphlet, Thoughts on Government. What Daniel Allen points to is the fact that it's at this point that Adams says happiness should be the end of all man and it should be government's chief goal to help man secure happiness. So she likes to point out that the big line in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of happiness and not, you know, just the pursuit of liberty. So those are ideas, again, that you can see embodied in the Declaration of Independence that that people were thinking about at that time. So I think if you look at the language, you read it carefully, look at the different punctuation in the document as you read it through carefully, you'll see why Americans felt they needed to be free and independent, different ideas that they wanted to pursue when they had their own government and different ideals that they wanted to pursue as a people. And that is what Jefferson looked to summarize in the document And express for everyone. Um, So everyone was clear on these goals and and what was going on. That was a good example of when Jefferson said he was not striving for originality uh, because some of these thoughts he had acknowledged right up front were already out there. Have you read a lot of David McCullough, Liz? You know, years ago, I had read John Adams, his biography, and then, you know, of course, his other biographies on like Truman and Teddy Roosevelt have, you know, in some ways a little to do with this conversation. 
I love David McCullough. I, I went back to his book before talking to you today, the one on John Adams, because I thought I had read, when I read the book, uh, something about the Declaration, and there is a really nice section, and one of the things I like about David McCullough was the way he creates a picture. So I will recap some of that, because I, I think it captures the spirit of things at the time. He said that Thomas Jefferson, after June 7th, he went upstairs in his room at 7th and Market Streets in Philadelphia, and he sat in his revolving Windsor chair. A portable writing box sat on his lap. He sat next to a folding desk that he designed himself and had made in Philadelphia. And the June days were already getting summer hot. So he's upstairs in this little room working on his portable writing box. He had no books with him. But he said he did not need them since his goal was only to place before mankind that common sense of the subject. That's a quote from Thomas Jefferson. He said it was not to be original in principle or sentiment, as we've talked, and that these concepts were, had already been the center of much public debate, writing, and conversation. Now, here's some of the things. These are some of the documents that David McCullough said that if Jefferson didn't have them in front of them, he had them in his mind. There was a recent draft of the Virginia Constitution. There was the Declaration of Rights for Virginia, and this may not have been a coincidence. That actually was published in the Pennsylvania Evening Post June 12th, and it was written by George Mason, and I'll quote from that. It said in there, All men are born equally free and independent and have certain inherent natural rights, and later, among which are the enjoyment of life and liberty. So there is some familiar language there that we see in the Declaration of Independence. Pennsylvania delegate James Wilson had written a pamphlet in Philadelphia in 1774. And to your point, these are not all original. These all sort of traded on each other, I think, from what I've read. All men are by nature equal and free. No one has a right to authority over another without his consent. A lawful government is founded on the consent of those who are subject to it. And then they all drew, admittedly, again, from English and Scottish writers like John Locke, David Hume, Francis Hutcheson, and others. So there is a, there is a body of work out there that, that the authors of the Declaration of Independence, and I say authors, this whole committee of five, drew from. But it does sound to me like Thomas Jefferson's writing, the core writing, did survive the editing process. The core of his writing did, as I said, you know, when the Congress meets as a committee of whole to debate and tinker with his draft, they cut about 25 percent of his language, including the charge, uh, maybe the 28th grievance, that King George III was responsible for slavery in North America. But they cut that because Southern pl slaveholders found it unpalatable, as did Northern slave traders. Um, so that got cut, which made Jefferson upset. We do know that Benjamin Franklin, you know, we talk about this committee of five and it really is significant because basically you have four of the five most populous and biggest colonies represented on that committee, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Virginia and New York. And Connecticut at that point had been one of the chief financiers of the war. Um, so the, the, the composition of the committee is really significant. And Benjamin Franklin's chief purpose on it was because he was this famous American. Everybody in Europe knew who Benjamin Franklin was, and they knew of him as a wise man, somebody who was really well known for his reason and science. So just having his name on the committee lent the declaration some gravitas. And so when you look at the Committee of Five, they say that Jefferson, Adams and Franklin did the majority of the work because, again, everybody's serving on a bazillion com different committees, so they have other work to do. And as we mentioned, Adams, of course, helped shape some of Jefferson's ideas that he used to draft it. And they say that Franklin, he one of the things that he did was he imported a lot of books about government and made those books available for Congress to use. So it's quite possible that Thomas Jefferson in his office would have had all these different pamphlets and books that Franklin had imported, you know, that he could reference in addition to those other resources you mentioned. And then, of course, they said that the other thing that Franklin did was he really went through and he suggested four or five major edits to the document, which really had to do with the fact that he told Jefferson, you could really use more precise language here. Like, why do you need to say the Hessians will deluge us in blood when you can just say the Hessians will destroy us? Like you get the message with fewer words that are more impactful. Um, so, yes, I think the body of Jefferson's ideas, the ideas that he really synthesized, you know, he pulled together from a lot of different places survive in that document. 
but he was always pretty upset that they cut 25% of his language. And, you know, I think he took, he took that editorial task a little, a little too personally. A lot of writers do. Being a public relations person myself by trade and having been in a newsroom, I, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, I can say that it did seem to go, uh, to anyone who's gone through an editor, it sounds like what Thomas Jefferson experienced was typical, but he didn't like it. But nevertheless, it went to Congress, and the final draft was presented before Congress on June 28, 1776, and went through that review and final process, and then Congress adopted the final text on July 4th, 1776. At that point, and this is where the public relations person in me starts to sit back and wonder, because you wonder how you can take a document that was basically handwritten and then printed in small quantities, and how does it then spread to the rest of the country and across the ocean? John Dunlap, the official printer, he worked through the night to set the declaration in type, and he printed roughly 200 copies. They called those the Dunlap broadsides. And they sent those to committees, assemblies, commanders in the Army, the Continental Army. And this version of the Declaration of Independence was not signed by the Continental Congress. There was just one name at the top. It was the printed version of John Hancock, who was the president of the Continental Congress. And I understand that one copy made it to King George a few months later. But in the meantime, the revolution was on. Can you explain a little bit about what it took for the declaration to spread either word of mouth or the document itself to the colonies so that they actually knew that they were declared an independent United States? You know, word of the adoption of the declaration pr spread pretty fast. So as you mentioned, John Dunlap was the first printer to print the declaration. My understanding is, is that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson on a shopping trip dropped off the draft at his print shop on the 4th. And by the evening of the 5th, he had new copies printed. He did print about 200 of those copies, according to the Declaration Resources Project, which is an online project done through Harvard. Danielle Allen, who I've been talking about throughout, she's one of the co-founders of that project. They have a lot of different resources. And one of the thing, in, bits of information they have on that site is there's probably only about 26 of the Dunlap printings of the Declaration still around. Um, but to your point about how people got to know this document is they do, Congress does send those 200 copies to different areas. Well, you have public readings. You know, in Boston, they stand out in front of what is now the old state house on the balcony and they read the Declaration of Independence to people. Then people go home and they tell their neighbors about it. You would have newspapers reprinting news from the, you know, in parts of the Declaration of Independence and sometimes the whole thing of the Declaration of Independence in their newspapers where you had access to newspapers. So print culture spreads really rapidly because they'd put it in a coffee shop or a tavern and many people would read it. Or if you were still able to get your subscription newspaper, which a few people did outside of the cities, you'd be sharing that newspaper with your neighbors. So none of these document, you know, newspapers and pamphlets get read just once. Many, many people will read them. Getting it to Europe was more complicated. So Silas Dean is like the, un the official unofficial American representative in France trying to convince the French government that it should support Amer the American cause. And that's among other things. His other job was to, to covertly get supplies from France and then ship them through this like um, shell company, you know, to America. So nobody could connect France and Spain, you know, Spanish funding to these supplies. And Dean is like really embarrassed because news of the declaration reaches England and that's how it gets to France. Like no one bothered to send him. He felt like the like an official printing of the declaration that he could give to the French government. And it turns out that what had happened was that it was lost on en on route. Like his ship was either captured by the British or the ship had been sunk, but just his copy of it never arrived. But this creates some diplomatic problems because it's not the Americans telling the French that the Americans have declared independence. It's other Europeans. But news really spreads word of mouth through the print culture of the day, and people start people start talking about it. What was what was it like as far as the press goes at that time? We did not technically have a free press at that point. So how are newspapers able to publicize the Declaration 
under British rule? Well, at that point, they've decided, uh, you know, Congress, July 4th, 1776, that's the date. We're no longer part of Great Britain. So the Americans knew that they were more independent from Great Britain at that point than Great Britain knew. I mean, of course, you have to think about it, right? The British army is occupying different parts of America. So not every part of, Amer you know, the British colonies is actually independent. So it's just, you know, it is just a document in that sense. It's it doesn't actually have any, you know, it doesn't clear the British army out of North America. That's what the war is going to do. In terms of the press, you know, the press is so effective that during the colonial times, you'll find that like in New York, when the king in England, because it was before the Act of Union of 1707, so pre-Great Britain, when King Charles II gets possession of what it was the former colony of New Netherland, he gives it to his brother, James, the Duke of York, and we have the colony of New York. And what James tells the proprietor governor, the, the person he's appointed to be governor of the colony, is don't let them establish a press. We give these people a press and they're going to be printing all these different ideas that maybe we don't want them to have. And the same goes for New Jersey, too. So there's different areas in the colonies where they they don't want a press established right away because, again, you have a press, then people are free to print their ideas and these ideas spread. So it was a major concern. Um, so during the war, the British try to capture as many colonial presses as they can. It's why you have presses. I'm trying I'm thinking specifically Isaiah Thomas. He was printer in Boston. And right before the raids of Lexington and Concord, he moves out to Worcester, Massachusetts to help protect his press because he knows that if Thomas Gage gets the chance, he's going to seize his press. So the colonists end up losing a bunch of different presses during the revolution. You can read about this actually in a great book called The Common Cause. So we talked about how the Declaration is supposed to rally Americans together. Robert Parkinson, the author of the book, The Common Cause, looks at how presses and different ideas, again, are supposed to help Americans get this sense of a common cause. Um, so the press is really, really important. And so if you're a patriot at this point and you have access to a press, and there are a few of them, they're printing this document and it's just like, we're already in war. Like, really, what's the British government going to do except maybe take our area and take our press? So they, th they end up printing it. Well, the British government tried to dismiss the declaration as a trivial document issued by disgruntled colonists. They tried to discredit the Declaration of Independence, but as you said, that was too little too late. So it did allow for the recognition of the United States. It took time, though. France, in 1778, signed its Treaty of Alliance. The Netherlands came forth in 1782, and they recognized the United States. Spain unofficially recognized the United States in 1779, but officially in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, which was the end of the American Revolution. I have a question for you, Liz, about today. The Declaration of Independence was a founding document, but it's still relevant today. Can you tell us the message of the Declaration of Independence through the past 240 years and what it means to us going forward? You know, it's funny because I asked a group of historians uh, this ex um, pretty much this exact question last year when I was working on a very special episode about how, you know, what went into the drafting of the Declaration of Independence. That's episode 141 of Ben Franklin's World, if you'd like to check it out. And uh, one of the things that, you know, the scholars that we had on that episode who've really studied, you know, the three different authors, Adams, Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson, they really pointed to the fact that it's equality and self-determination that are the key principles that have inspired us to act collectively at different times throughout American history. And I can see that. I mean, if you look at, if you read the Declaration of Independence, and this actually goes for all historic documents, if you pull out a historic document like the Declaration and you read it now, no matter what you try to do, your views and reading of it is going to be colored by our own 21st century. So whatever problems or, you know, issues that you think we have today in the United States, you're going to read the Declaration kind of with that lens. And you can try to ignore them, but no matter what you do, you're never going to be 100 percent objective on this. So what you're going to do is you're going to read the Dunlap broadside. And you can do this because for that episode 141, the American Philosophical Society gave the Omohundro Institute really high res resolution images of that Dunlap broadside. And if you download the OI Reader app, um, you can search that in any oh, app store of your cho choice, the OI Reader app. You can for free download the image of the Dunlap broadside and go through and we have it annotated so you can click different things and see what what different language and whatnot means. But if you read 
those declarations and different versions of them, you'll find slightly different punctuation. And that punctuation is really, really important. Again, reflecting different people's reading of the document. So when you go through, go through it really carefully, pay attention to punctuation and phrasing. It was a document that was meant to be read aloud. And look up any words that you don't know. And I think that'll help you read it with a really powerful sense of, of what was going on. And, you know, again, these scholars will point out no matter when people have read it, they have found and identified with the language in it. And that language has caused them to rise up and ask for reform, ask for change uh, in different periods of different times. The Civil War, civil rights. You know, I, you can even think of it today with the with the income inequality issues. Um, you've seen different groups hold up the declaration saying these are the values that are embodied by our nation. And we don't feel that they're embodied right now. And this is why this is why we're rising up. And, you know, it's such a document that has had such staying power. It was the first declaration of its kind. And since it was published in July of 1776, over 100 nation states and freedom organizations have used the declaration as their model for declaring their own independence and justifying their own rebellion against authority. So when you look at the declaration today, you can point to that heritage and say, wow, that is a document with clear impact. The Declaration of Independence tapped the American spirit, and it seems to have fed the American spirit, and it fed freedom and the desire for freedom around the world. Liz Kovart, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Make sure to check out our show notes for more information on everything that we talked about today. You'll find a complete bio on our guest, Liz Covart, her work, and her podcast, Ben Franklin's World. You'll find links for more information on the Declaration of Independence, and you can listen to other episodes. And don't miss the next episode. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion podcast in many ways, and they're all free and easy to find on iTunes and at shapingopinion.com. This is where we talk about the people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.